can't forget our past love can live regretting it all our mistakes one of us are making I couldn't help myself in love I've been bound to fall it's the darkness that hurts the most it's the lonely that she So I started my, my started my engineering career um, proper. Uh, I did a course at um, City of Westminster again twenty six years ago now thirty years ago. Um, mm. Yeah, thirty years ago. Good lord! It's okay. Um, we don't need to talk about the time <laughs> frame. <laughs> Um, so yeah, city city of Westminster um, College further education um, in mm -hmm. Paddington in London, mm -hmm. and it was great. It was a very basic course, a lot of electrical engineering, um, okay. tape editing. So yeah, I came I came up in the the old days of tape and yeah, actually cutting two inch tape across an entire band and sticking all that stuff together, which was which was fantastic. Um, and I managed to get through that a internship at uh, the Barbican with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Oh, and that cool. was an incredible experience. If anyone has the opportunity to get into theatre. It um, sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. They built, yeah. so they were doing a show. Um, it was all, I think it was to do with the Russian Revolution or something, or maybe the Cold War. I can't remember. It was somewhere, something mm -hmm. to do with Russia. And they needed to, they had a scene that was a, um, it's supposed to be sort of in a train or a train station. And to create the feeling of bass, because they didn't have the subs and all of this sort of stuff, uh, and to create the feeling of bass and to rattle the front rows was the kind of the direction. Oh, they wow. um, So the sound guys, it was me, a guy called Monkey, and I can't remember the other guy's name, but amazing people, just I credit them with a lot. They, they were fantastic people. Um, we lost touch, unfortunately. Um they built this massive, great big horn speaker. Must have been at least probably six or seven meters long, with okay. a huge horn I could stand up in at the end. So for for for, for non um, non metric people, that six meters. I don't know what is that. That's like maybe uh, I don't know what is that. Like 12, 14 foot, something like that. I'm not sure. Maybe more. Um, but yeah, the height of the horn at the end was about sort of six foot and they put it under the stage. So when the train sound effect went past, the front sort of three or four rows would just rattle and shake because of this sort of the bass coming out of this this horn speaker. So, Oh, um, nice. Awesome. Yeah. So that was kind of cool. That was that was just, you know, I think for me, that was an introduction into what is the outcome that you want to achieve and uh -huh. just do something cool, build something. They mm. were never about rules. It was never, oh, you can't do that because of this. And that oh, wow. saw me through when I went into recording studios. I, I applied to a whole bunch of studios in the days when you would actually run around and give them your CV and a piece of paper. You didn't email it or anything. Uh huh. And I, I got a reply from a studio called Matrix Recording Studios um, who were based in Little Russell Street. Mm-hmm. 
and when and I was a tea boy um, so basically just a runner you know I'd go and do whatever needed to be done and get things for the the artists or the engineers or the producers um, and eventually got into uh, being an assistant um, and I, they were a, they were an amazing studio they were the biggest independent studio in the UK at the time they had um, three studios in Little Russell Street um, mm -hmm. two SSL and one Soundcraft desk and mm -hmm. in fact for all the nerds out there one of the SSLs that they had which is a 4000 series with the I'm trying to remember if it was the black or the brown knobs mm -hmm. but it was actually one of the early prototype SSLs okay um, yeah and that was amazing we recorded um we recorded Elastica on that um I worked with uh gosh a whole bunch of people Ronnie Size that was super cool um Brown Bag so his song Brown Bag we did on we we did a bunch of stuff on that desk um which mm -hmm. was super awesome um, Sounds and then awesome. they also had yeah it was it was Ronnie Size Brown Bag check it out it's a great song okay um and then, and we did, uh, they had another studio in, or complex in Fulham in Studridge Street, um, which was sort of a residential area of Fulham. So again, two, I uh, know, sorry, that was a, an SSL mixing room with a small vocal booth downstairs, like a 48 track. Um, so nice. two Otari, um, two inch machines. And then they had upstairs, um, they had a Neve frame. But the EQ wasn't Neve, and I reached out to the studio manager uh, or the owner uh, a few weeks ago just to, in preparation for this to find out what the EQ was because it wasn't Neve, and I've got a feeling it was like Kadak or something because mm -hmm. the desk automation was also, I think, was Kadak. Okay. Um, but, yeah, the frame was Neve because it had the Lindell, um, the Lindell compressors, desk compressors on there, um, and yeah, that had a recording room. And I'll come back to that. I've got a couple of stories that I can I can tell you about that okay. place because that was awesome. All right. Um, and then we also they also owned Maison Rouge. And for all of the music nerds out there, that was um, Jethro Tull's old studio, which was Maison Rouge oh, in, wow. in in Fulham Broadway. Yeah, that was where um, again for people that might be watching Warren's videos, uh, where Blur recorded. Um, uh, modern life is rubbish okay and i think park life as well um that source a lot of action it's that that place maison rouge we had people robbie williams go through there oasis um wow gosh yeah wow. lots and lots of people that was bomb the base there was loads of people that, that went through that studio that was super sounds cool. like it. three rooms three a rooms big, massive yeah two big ssl rooms like recording rooms uh -huh, fantastic uh -huh. drum room at the back of one of the studios like a brick drum cool. room that you could close off or open up very um, cool that was that was awesome i worked with um uh god georgie fame and paul weller mm -hmm. and um uh oh my god bass player from the stones what is wrong with me bill bill wyman <laughs> uh bill wyman yeah bill wyman come. There. and actually He's, yeah, I know my brain. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, Bill Wyman, we recorded. Um, so the the studio. Oh, and I haven't finished. Uh, I'll come back to that. Sorry. Okay. No I'm problem. a terrible Go ahead. tangent person. Um, <laughs> then <laughs> the last studio they had was uh, Wessex, which was in Highbury and Islington. Oh, no. And they had another one in. Uh, was that theirs? Oh, no, that was someone else's. So, yeah, Wessex in Highbury in Islington. Um, and that was a studio where um, uh, Day, at the, uh, Day at the Races was, yeah, Night at the Opera, which is the one with the white cover. Is it Day at the Races or Night at the Opera? I can't okay. remember. The Queen album. So um, that was recorded at Wessex. And never mind the, never mind the bollocks, the, the, um, the, the Sex Pistols album. And uh, Clash, London Calling, as well, uh, was all recorded at Wessex. So being in that room um, and being in the same room where Freddie Mercury, Queen, yeah. Yeah. 
um, Sex Pistols, uh -huh. Clash. Yes. Like, how amazing is that? That's just... Super amazing. Right? <laughs> so just being in those sort of hallowed rooms, you're like, wow, this is just, yeah, that was... So that were was, you like yeah. having that outer body experience? You know, the sad thing is, the sad thing is, she, when we, <clears throat> now, you've got the internet, right? So yeah. you can find out anything. And I say this to my kids all the time. Yeah. When we were growing up, if you wanted to find something out, you would have to go and get an encyclopedia and look it up or go to the library or uh -huh. you would have to do work to find that thing out. Yeah. Um, and, and I didn't know that. I didn't know that these albums were recorded in that studio. Wow. Um, yeah. So I only found out about that. I think the, cause they did some work on Bohemian Rhapsody at, at Wessex, um, not a huge amount. I think it was a little bit that they did there, uh, maybe some comping or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of knew about that. Um, okay. But I didn't know about all of those other albums. So, I mean, it was an amazing space, like a huge, big recording room, um, live room, which was which was amazing space. Um, but I didn't know about any of these, these things. So, you know, I was a little snot-nosed kid at the age of 20. Um, right. Sorry, one sec. <clears throat> I talk too much and my computer goes to sleep. Um, oh. <coughs> <there we> go. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at mine. It's still hanging in there. <laughs> yeah, it's still going. It's all good. Um, so yeah, I was a I was a I was a snot snot nosed kid, you know, age of early twenties that was just arrogant, didn't know anything from anything and just mm -hmm. I missed out on a lot of opportunities yeah. because of that. So yeah. be open people, be open to things. Um, yeah. and and be humble and appreciative of your surroundings. So um, um so what what DAW are you using um when you're doing all your mixing and recording? What DAW do you use? Um so I'm primarily Pro Tools. Okay, Pro um, Tools, very popular. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I started out in, um, I started out in Reason. So when I left the music industry and went and recorded voices um, for video games, mm -hmm. we had two systems. We would have in back in the day when Sound Designer was still a thing. So we would, um, and sorry, Sound Designer files were what you used in in Pro Tools. Um, so we had Pro Tools for actually recording um, and some editing, and then we'd use SoundForge for getting in in real detail um, into the, the sound files and cutting out pops okay. and clicks and all that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. I don't know if people know SoundForge. Do you know SoundForge? Have you heard of SoundForge? Yeah, I've heard of SoundForge. Oh, okay, cool. There you go. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, I, I don't see it very often, right? It's become acid. Um, yeah, that was all yes. the acid stuff. Um, yeah. I think I own I own a few. I still own a few acid loops, so. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, there you go, so. Right? Um, definitely. So then, I liked SoundForge. It was actually pretty cool, so. Oh, I loved SoundForge. It was great. Yeah. yeah so I don't really, know why really they get rid of tool. the stuff that's working, you know. Still haven't mm -hmm. figured that out yet. <laughs> Keep the stuff that's mm -hmm. working. <laughs> yeah. True story. True yeah. story, she. But go ahead. So, yeah, so so Pro Tools, mainly Pro Tools, but I write in Reason. If, oh, I, if cool. I write music, I write in Reason. Yeah. Okay. Um, any pros and cons about Pro Tools? I hear it so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, you know, it's... Um, it, uh, it's it's what you know, honestly. Yeah. Um, I but write inter in reason. but interesting enough that that you write in reasons you write in reason, but you don't mm. in Pro Tools. So that's interesting. Yeah. Why do you do that? So I find reason has a much easier creative workflow. If I want to drop in a loop, or I want to mess up. Um, a sample or just drop some stuff onto it to make it sound super weird uh -huh. um, I can and it's really easy but that's okay, because I okay. know it really well I've been using reason since like version three. Oh wow um, yeah so yeah from that perspective and I, 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 
I know it well enough to be able to do that stuff quickly and easily. Um, but uh, I wouldn't ever say that I'm an expert on it. Um, okay. You know, if someone said to me, hey, I want this sound, I'd probably struggle to be able to make that for them. Yeah. Um, but if I, if I kind of go, I just want a different sound, okay, mm -hmm. I'll put this sample in and then I'll drop this instrument on top of it and then this player and see what happens. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Well, so you, that's you my know, like reason. You know, the old saying, stick with what you know, just stick with it, mm -hmm. with what you know, right? So, yeah, yeah, because exactly. I use Studio exactly. One, but, you know, I, I started in Pro Tools, though. I did, mm -hmm. I did start in Pro Tools, and then I went to um, Studio One. But I know if you want to do the, the big Hollywood movies, you got to learn Pro Tools. So mm -hmm. I would have to, like, dust dust it off and, you know, get reacquainted with Pro Tools again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Pro Tools is fine. It it for For an old school engineer like me, it feels like I am looking at a tape machine and a mm -hmm. desk a mixing desk mm -hmm. so that's why i i i went to pro tools because it feels like i've tried using reaper and i think it's more about just time poor i mean we're all time poor right sheila so um learning a new system and and uh one of the guys in the in the academy absolutely god bless him was so kind and sent me a whole bunch of resources and tips on how to use it and i need to actually read them and go through them and give it a yeah. crack um yeah. but uh i just haven't had time you know and i think when i'm like oh, okay i just want to get in and do some mixing and just mess around with stuff you mm -hmm. know pro tools is just because i know it, it's easy and quick and i just get in there and just do it you know so right yeah it's all yeah. about how did you why did you why did you move to uh to personas to studio oh One? wow um basically because it's awesome it's it's uh <laughs> <laughs> the learning curve i mean there there's hardly any learning curve you know um mm. there's tons of videos instructional videos out there on studio one and um you won't you won't have any problems getting started with it and once once you get through the first introductory video you're up and running basically mm. and mm. Uh, so it's it's easy to learn the the learning curve is it's real quick real quick not tedious at all and that's why i took to it you know i'm like oh all you got to do is this and all you got to do is that and i'm like okay um i said i'm really i'm really feeling this doll here you know and the big thing with with my Pro Tools sessions, they kept on crashing my computer and right. and it was killing my productivity. So mm. I just needed a DAW that didn't crash. Basic principles right there. <laughs> yep. So I found, I found Studio One. It didn't crash at all. And that's what I stuck with. But you know, hey. Perfect. You know, that's, that's, that's how it goes sometimes. But um, absolutely. Back back to your um, you said you wanted to tell another engineering story. Oh, um, <clears throat> yeah. Jeez, which one was that? <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's many. I think um, the 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 you know the 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 one of the rooms at the studios in Little Russell Street, um, and people talk about, you know, uh, SSLs and Neves and APIs and all of this sort of stuff. I think one of the things that I think is important to understand is that um, great, great music, and this kind of goes to your point about, you know, nerding out on, on hardware yeah. um, and, and all of that sort of stuff. There is some great hardware and there is mm -hmm. some classic vintage hardware, mm -hmm. but it's not what you need to make great music. Um, you know, like, uh, was it Greg Wells? 
I think it was, or maybe someone else, I can't remember, but just when asked what was, you know, Warren, Warren says this one as well, um, you know, what's the right mic to use for, for recording a vocal? And it's like, whichever mic is set up. And the same thing with this, this studio in uh, Matrix, it was an old Soundcraft desk. It was okay. like a 30, I think a 32 channel desk. Mm -hmm. It was not fantastic. It was kind of noisy. Okay. Um, and, but, you know, like you'd have a whole band in there. I recorded Bill Wyman with um, doing, he did a thing for, for some TV show that was strings. So like a string quartet and a brass section. And it sounded great. It sounded great. Cool. Um, you know, and it was just, the musicians were awesome. Um, the, the production was cool and just really easy to work with people. And when you create a vibe like that, the, 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 the hardware that you've got is not important. Now, that being said, if you want to give me a Pultec EQP1A or a couple of 1176s <laughs> or a DBX160 or a DBX902 DSA, I am not going to stop you. Like, please. Yes. Understood. I will 100% take that. <laughs> understood. Completely understand mm -hmm. that one. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah, see, the nerds are going to love this. <laughs> Bless the nerds. We are all nerds. Well, you Embrace are, your inner nerd. Yeah, you you have great um, engineering stories. That that's top notch. There. Um, <laughs> I you have quite. I could a, tell you a few more, but we'd have to do that in person and definitely not recorded. Oh, okay. Hey, we'll we'll <laughs> we'll figure out a way to talk again. So we'll we'll talk off camera. Um, <laughs> so we already exchanged information, so we'll keep in touch for sure. There you go. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, some more nerdy questions here. When, mm. when, when mixing, do you use EQ before compression or after? Um, so this kind of goes to my earlier point. I, the, the course I did for for music and record it was very engineering heavy um and it was electrical engineering um understanding how to fix things soldering all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. with a bit of understanding of tape tape mm -hmm. splicing and yeah. editing but the big thing that it gave me it didn't teach me the rules about whether you should do compression after EQ or EQ after compression, uh -huh. or you should only compress four to one or two to one on vocals or you know, none of this stuff. So when I came into it, I was just learning by what sounded good and yes. what other engineers and producers were teaching me. Yes. So look, my go-to is generally EQ after compression. Okay. But um, if I want to put EQ before compression and just for some reason i happen to do that um and it sounds good i'm mm -hmm. like yeah great it sounds good i don't care <laughs> it's fine um you know i i mean i think there are some times when if you are going to if you're planning to heavily eq a vocal or an eq an instrument then um you probably want to do that um and uh then put compression, but then not touch the EQ after you've done that, because anything that you do to the EQ is going to impact how that sound compresses. Exactly. Um, you know, right? So I would, like I said, my, my, my go-to is generally compression, then EQ. Um, but yeah, like, uh, I guess my... My, my my like a vocal chain for example um i would generally ds with something uh, yeah. at the moment because yeah. uh, you know i'm sort of i'm in the box so um i would usually go um uh like a waves ds or one of the old school ds i, I tried the new one the sibilance it, it i find it a little bit tricky for me so yeah I'd just go a DSer, then um 
probably a uh, compressor, like an 1176 or an LA-2A, okay. um, depending on, yeah, probably an LA-2A just to kind of hold it. Yeah. And then an 1176 to catch peaks. Yeah. And then going into an EQ, like a Marg or something. Um, I'm, I'm really loving the um, kit, the BBN 105 which is their emulation of the, the Blackbird Neve EQ. Um, oh, I'm nice. really loving that, actually, at the moment. That's yeah. really nice. Um, and, yeah, probably a Pultec in there as well. Um, and then maybe DS again at the end. I think the um, multiple small bits of compression yeah. will give you, I feel, will give you a better sound. Exactly. In my personal opinion. No, I'm, I'm um, with you rather there. Rather than... I'm with you there. Right? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. Here we go now. 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 Let's get it. Here we go now. Here we go now. Here we go now. 